So if the title strikes you as a little strong, it's meant to be. What I'm going to be talking about today is Connecticut. But Connecticut really is a tiny little representative of what happens in the rest of the country. Small state, perhaps manageable, but still a representative of what happens in the rest of the country. Something's going on with the mic, I think. All right, so Connecticut is home to 143 languages that are not English in, Connecticut, in, in K through 12 schools. Among those languages, Spanish is number one, spoken by the majority of the population. Portuguese is number two. And then there's lots and lots and lots of others. Pashto, um, Urdu, Arabic, American Sign Language, all sorts of languages. And among those children, in each school, there's more than, uh, in many schools, there's more than 100 children speaking the same language. Just a setup here. Let's take a look a little at the numbers of, such, of, of these individuals and what they get for English language support. What you should see on this particular screen of graph is the fact that children who are enrolled in English language learner programs are not the only children who find themselves using a language other than English at home. Roughly speaking, this is the data from 2014, 2015, straight from uh, Connecticut State Department of Education website. Roughly speaking, Connecticut K through 12 schools boast 75,000 children for whom English is not the dominant language, out of whom only 35,000 are enrolled in English language programs. And before I tell you more about this in the event that you know nothing about this, let me briefly give you a chance to take a look at this table. Spend a second or two. You may or may not know anything about education. You may or may not know anything about teacher support or, ch or, or English support in school. But what you should be able to tell by just reading is the fact that the types of programs that occur across the state are very much varied. So the first thing you ought to be asking yourself is this. So can I ensure that children who go to school in Avon will get the same kind of English support that children who go to school in Hartford? Can I assure th ensure that children who go to school in Waterbury who speak Arabic at home will, it, will get the same kind of English support the children that go to school in Bloomfield that speak Urdu? And the answer is no. You cannot ensure that at all. But let's begin at the beginning. 1964 Civil Rights Act, followed closely by Elementary and Secondary Education Act, also known as ESEA, um, 1965, and um, its famous cousin, No Child Left Behind, reaffirmed in 2001, says something like this. Every child for whom English is not a first language is entitled to being instructed by a person who knows what they're doing in terms of English language support. That doesn't seem like rocket science. Connecticut Department of Education, Connecticut Board of Education, said, you know, that seems like a really good idea. And in 2010, they came out with a position paper that says, yes, it is crucial for children who are speaking at home languages other than English. It is crucial that they actually get support for language. And that support can come in a variety of ways. And only in that way will they be able to succeed academically. Let's take a look at why this might matter in general. I mean, apart from the obvious reasons. English language learners in this state tend to live in poverty. So what you should be looking at is the blue bars. These are children for whom English is not um, a second language, is a first language, as best as we can tell, native language. Here's them on the free and reduced lunch programs. Let's take a look at English speakers who are learning the language. The numbers of those kids in the free and reduced lunch programs are double. Let's take a look at the nature of the district that these children attend. The vast majority of English language learners in this state attend urban districts that are very much underfunded, 
have all sorts of problems that we have seen um, across urban districts and shall we say poverty. Many of these children have also been identified for disabilities and certain disabilities that we know make it much more complicated than some others for children to learn, we also see English language learners being overrepresented in. For instance, specific language impairment and learning disabilities. English language learners appear to be identified more for those. The numbers are not encouraging the last count, there were about 6,000 children who are English language learners who, are also, who also presented with disabilities. That number has risen by 36% from the previous count. And in the event that this particular piece of information was not enough, let me show you something else. Among the children who are English language learners who also have disabilities, many more wind up being suspended both in school and outside of school. So why might this be? Remember the law. The law says children are entitled to receiving English support by educators that know what they're doing, as in trained and certified educators in English language support, also known as TESOL. Commitment from the State Department of Education was that yes, we will respect that. That of course is something you would expect since this is a federal law. Why? Well, that's because academically these children do not perform as well as you might want to. For instance, brown bars or orange bars, whatever it is you're seeing here, orange bars show your children who were never identified as English language learners, probably native speakers of English, although that's not entirely clear. Here's their performance on Connecticut Mastery Test. And here's the children, the blue bars, who are English language learners. That's their performance on Connecticut Mastery Test. Here's the brown and or orange bars of native English speakers on the academic performance test, also known as CAPT, and here for math, oh, for, for English, and here they are the blue bars for English language learners, as in not doing really well at all. Now, I will also ask you to focus a bit on this white bar, and you will see my um, circling of the white bar. Former ELLs are the children who have, in, in fact, gone through English learner support in this state, as in they've exited, as in they've shown to have mastered English, not doing so well in academics, not doing so well at all. So how can we talk about this indi these individuals? Let's summarize this a bit. Well, one thing we can say is this, English language learners by the way, usually comfortable with more than one language outside of English. In this state, which as I mentioned, is just a token for what happens in the rest of the country, tend to underperform when compared to um, native English speakers. They live in predominantly low SES conditions and districts. They present higher rate for disabilities. And by the way, there is no mandate currently that says if you are going to be a special education teacher, you really do need to know what to do with English learners. Because you know, there may be a child tomorrow from Pakistan or Azerbaijan who will also have autism. There is no such mandate. These children attend school districts that are, that are typically underfunded and underperform on all other markers. And they're also in classes with primarily black and, black and brown children with white teachers. And this is a conversation we had a little earlier. One final say I will say, uh, thing I will say about this particular group is when they do receive English language support, it is geared towards an immersion into English, assimilationist style support, assimilationist style educational system. 
If bilingual education exists, as it does in the state, that bilingual education is simply transitional, as in let me support you for your language right now and then gently withdraw it so that you could learn how to speak English correctly and so you could exist in completely English classroom. Well, that's no good, I'm going to argue, as, no, as other people have. Well, one of the reasons this is no good is because it brings us back to the conversation of success and dysfunctional children and underprivileged ones. Right, and the question is, well, you know, do we sit here and try to come up with a way of fix success rates and somehow take away the lack of privilege, if that's at all possible, so we can fix these children? Penny Cook has talked about this quite a bit, and so has Fair. Since 1970s, this conversation has been on the agenda. Another question we might want to ask is, what is happening in the school that mirrors the social inequalities and cultural inequalities? And are the children for whom English is not a first language and who primarily do represent black and brown bodies fall into that particular pattern? And what do we do about them? Well, one thing to think about is the following. The way English language support is currently set up and framed in this state and in this country in general is what I argue to be colonial. Well, how do we know? Well, let's take a look at some features of colonialism. Well, we know about colonial, we know one thing about colonialism is it preaches lack of racial literacy. Right, so color doesn't exist. We don't see color here. Well, that's not really true because only white people can afford not to see color. Only the privileged. What else do we know about colonialism? Well, we know colonialism heavily relies on the written discourse and sort of essentially ostracizes all the discourses that are not written. Well, that is exactly what we see with English learner support in this country. Typically, only elite bilinguals survive um, in such courses. So children who come from European countries and who have had great, great support and literacy in their L1 do much better than kids that come from Africa, for instance, because they don't have the skills. And the inequality continues. And of course, not all children are able to be read to. Many children, as we pointed out, live in poverty. The parents have three jobs and may not have books in the house or may not be literate in their many, many, many tribal languages. Such children do, in fact, suffer at the hand of this colonial educational system. One other aspect of such colonialist system is the over-reliance on technology and shiny curricula, as I call it. Right, the books that are pretty, the, book, the iPads that get to go to one school but not to the other. If the curricula necessarily rely on technology, then they will not be able to be used with children whose districts do not have the money to buy such curricula. And discrimination continues. And of course, last but not least, is defining the privileged class as the norm, right? The language that you hear in educational psychology and the language that you see in educational reason, uh, leadership uh, discourse is we want self-directed learners, we want independent thinkers, we want in effective, sort of effective exercises that allow the child to move on her own. We don't want passive learners, we don't want spoon-fed learners. Well, what this means is that more active, self-directed, and independent thinkers are the thinkers of the Western world. That is the discourse. The vast majority of the world that does not think the way the Eurocentric world thinks will not object to a passive learner because part of learning is being passive. So what we need instead then is local learning strategies, as in, if you work in a Hartford school system, you need to live in Hartford. You need to know what these children are exposed to and how their world is. 
We need teachers and administrators who rely heavily on theory because a, because a strategy that worked in a district X will not be a panacea, it will only work for district X. The only way to have correct curriculum for an English language learner is to rely on research that says, let's take a look at what else is going on in that profile. We absolutely positively need to, to confront our own privileges. Everybody who looks like me, everybody whose English is native or, not, or fluent needs to take a look at the privilege that comes not only with color, but also with being a native speaker or, not, uh, or, or near native. And unlike much of the discourse that goes on, on the sidelines, I will argue that the privilege ought not have the power to, to ameliorate the problem. Because the minute you give the privilege the power, you have given them the power. The power ought to go to the margins. What today is the margins? In order for people to maintain their identity. So what do we need then? We need educators that are taught by people who can fo force them to confront their own identity and force them to bring in the other identity. We need to ensure that all children for whom English is not a first language are taught by certified professionals. So no waivers will do. No tutors will do. You need to be credentialed. We need to ensure that bilingual education, which is in fact mandatory, hello, that's the law, in fact does happen for all children. If that means more funding, that's what that means. Find the money somewhere. We also need to ensure that, that bilingual education is dual education and not the assimilationist transitional kind that children are able to rely on their parents and their grandparents and their aunts and uncles for stories that they can later bring into the classroom. We need uh, also quality curricular materials that are available for all sorts of children, not only the privileged ones. And all kids need to have access to it across ability levels and proficiency levels. Lots more to talk about, but I'll stop here. <laughs>